Yeah, just um, specifically around the pricing thing, um, what, what are the main um, pricing models you've seen and is there, is there any that are kind of emerging that could be um, common or popular? Was that for all three of us or for me? Yeah, sorry for you. Okay, so the, 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 op the options I see is a subscription model on a monthly basis. That seems to be something that people are familiar with and um, uh, it's manageable for the customer. It's a kind of a fixed cost um, you know, that they can plan for it. Um, I see also some who are doing per project or per compiled application. That's those companies that prefer the IDE or the game engine environment and, and that strategy. Um, that doesn't seem very scalable to me. If the whole world is going to be enriched with augmented reality, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford to enrich things on a project by project or pay on a project by project basis or a target by target basis. So those are the, the two that I see as being the leaders right now, but I'd, I'd like to see some more diversity. I'll just say that there, there is a trend. Um, you know, Vuforia was purchased by PTC, and um, their, some of their new business models involve um, seeking some portion of revenue from the applications you create. Um, so I don't know how popular that is, but uh, that is another business model out there. So we have just, um, so at Ketum we have explored actually the three. Um, so subscription um, per, almost per app and uh, a revenue share. And it really depends on the customer um, because some, they work on a project and the customer has a closed budget for that project. So they are, um, they prefer that. Others understand the subscription because the subscription allows them for more flexibility, at least in our platform, so they can grow and they can shrink at any time. Um, and the revenue share works very well when you have no idea how much revenue you will make. So uh, for our customers, in, in, instead of making a, an investment at the beginning, they can leverage on their growth and, and we align both, both businesses. Okay, great, thanks. Other questions, comments? And if you could just let the panel know if it's for one in particular or just the whole panel, your question. Yep, uh, it's for all three of you. Um, so we talked about exporting data and then doing authoring on top of the CAD data. And I have two questions. The first one is, what's your experience with re reconciling when we talked about PLM when the CAD data changes and you've authored on top of that? How, how do you deal with that? And I was surprised to also see that all of the different authoring tools that, that you mentioned, uh, we're doing the authoring post-processing. Have you ever seen a use case where we do authoring with tools from PTC, DASO, Siemens, or whoever, and, and we actually process not only the CAD data, but also the, the authoring content for consumption on the augmented reality, on, on an augmented reality platform? So, um, I'll answer the, um, the second question. There was a, uh, in the proposed taxonomy for these different platforms and tools, there is a row that is, um, that the that augmented reality is a feature within a larger content management system or process management system. And so you have Autodesk is working in that, um, uh, Trimble, PTC, uh, quite a few, open text is going to come out with that very soon. So th I think that um, augmented reality will be embedded into a feature of workflow and process management systems. The problem with that is that, or one of the issues I have is um, it, it will be confining because the augmented reality experience will only be openable and playable, uh, accessible to the customer using the tool that the um, author defined. Uh, so the optimum would be, to, in my opinion, to create those 
experiences in that environment with all the logic and the properties that came with it, but then be able to um, view it in the device and the software of the customer's choice, meaning um, the company that bought the Caterpillar tractor or the company that is operating that power plant, rather than dictating to them about what client application they have to choose. Um, so I'll say that uh, I think that would be a great idea to to have it integrated on the uh, model based side, and um, I know that Autodesk and some other companies have, have tried that. Um, I think generally what they found was that they struggled with some of the issues that uh, that are the reason that things are still on the DCC side, and that is that performance, and also the fact that. Um, they, the tracking technology is changing quickly, and it really hasn't become the kind of commodity that can just easily be added in on that side of it. There's also a lot of um, uh, spe expert or specific knowledge that goes into generating AR, uh, such as handling part occlusions and, um, and dealing with, you know, dealing with tracking is still almost on a case-by-case -case basis still. Uh, we use different tracking technologies for different you know, situations. So I just don't think it's quite ready yet to be deployed from that side of the fence yet. Um, but I think it, it makes a lot of sense, definitely. And I, I hear that from our customers a lot, saying, well, why can't we have it you know, on this side of the fence? And frankly, it just, it just hasn't made it there yet. Okay, any other questions? Sure. Uh, one of the interesting things that you notice is that uh, some of the vendors are doing a dual license of both open source as well as commercial licenses. Could you give us a state of the world with regard to open source toolkits, where you think they are and whether um, they are a viable alternative? I'll say something about that. I mean, a, a good example there would be Daiquiri and their purchase of um, AR toolkit. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, AR toolkit, the open source AR toolkit uh, doesn't, it supports um, natural feature tracking, but it doesn't support any sort of what's popularly called extended tracking. And uh, there's no, uh, and Daiquiri has no intention that I know of, of they have, they have their own extended tracking technology, but I don't think they have any intention of handing that over to the open source community at the moment. So, um, you know, I guess when it gets old and dusty enough, they will, but until then, it's still the same open source problem that, you know, it rely, it's gonna rely on the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears of the open source community to develop something and it, it will probably continue to have the uh, issues that open source software has um, in the sense that you know it, it, it's not commercial. If I may, if I may so I think that uh, if you look at o other open source communities or so outside of augmented reality, what you see is that the number of contributors is almost as large as the number of consumers of that um, software. Um, but in augmented reality, you have hundreds of thousands of developers, and unfortunately, you have a handful of providers of tracking technology. So unless these hundreds of thousands of developers are willing to give me their money, uh, I need to find business models to support the R&D, and it's an important uh, side of my business, at least, uh, investing in this R&D. So I think that from this perspective, if we manage as a community to um, invite many more people to develop tracking technologies. Maybe it has to come from the university, maybe it has to come from other places, but it, it requires computer vision knowledge and expertise. So if we manage to do that, then we can uh, work on open source. But otherwise, I think that it's a problem of scale. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I agree with both of you. So I, I think, um, you, one place I would disagree, David, is you say there's hundreds of thousands of developers. 
Yeah, there are 100,000 people who downloaded the AR toolkit and who used it once. That doesn't make them contributors to the improvement of that software. And so we have a severe lack of people who know how to feed and nurture and maintain and expand open source software. And who's going who's gonna to fund that? It, 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 there's a severe shortage of people with those skills. So a couple more comments about this subject. Um, you know, uh, you, tracking technology is really a, the purview of research labs. And it is, it is something that everyone who consumes AR technology wants, just like they want they wanted GPS on their phone. But they didn't rush out and develop it. Um, you know, it, it needed to be commoditized and turned and developed by professionals into something that is now built into your phone. And you know, there's a trend there. You know, the elephant in the room, the uh, purchase of Matayo uh, by by Apple, is really a part of what may very well be eventually the case that AR development will be about content creation, but not about tracking. And so. Uh, you know, we may find that tracking is built into Apple and built into Android, uh, you know, some Google Tango here and there. And so it may, um, it's hard for me to imagine a, a big open source community around um, tracking technology. And there's so much potential to um, have special t specialization. Like I thought uh, David was gonna talk about the tracking and recognition of reflective surfaces were just like really a long ways from figuring out how to discern the difference between the reflection of the world and the world itself. Uh, and I'd want a different tracker for faces and I'd want a different tracker for hands and I need a different tracker for furniture. And so if you had a modular approach that would allow you to swap in and out and find so that when the camera, when you, when you point the camera at something, it says, oh, I see a lot of edges. Let me see. Uh, I'm outside. Hold on. I better go get my outdoor tracker. Um, that would be really uh, fundamental and groundbreaking. So I, I actually have a, a topic I'd like to get your thoughts on myself. So, um, and it came from your presentation, David, when you showed the example uh, using the valve, closing the valve and using your app. Uh, and the topic is animations. And animations are expensive to create and to maintain. And so uh, from my experience and perspective, you know, building airplanes, there, there are so many jobs to do, so many tasks, there's no way we could ever animate them. A lot of times we don't even have instructions or models in 3D as it is. So I'm curious as to you know, your guys' experience in terms of uh, your customers and networks, you know, how many people are really calling for animations in their content? How many really need it? And is the ROI there is still valid? If you spend all the money to create and maintain animations, is it still uh, a feasible um, thing to do? And that's for anyone who would like to answer. And then, so we, we, ourselves, we don't uh, work on animations. Uh, we have partners that work on that. And I think um, it, it, for me, it all comes down to the value that is delivered to whoever is using that experience. So if it's a, um, so let's move outside of enterprise and, and industrial applications for a second. So if it's about entertainment, uh, you want that content to be very well curated. And actually part of the revenue comes from the quality of that content. So if you think about gaming, the quality is, is a, a, a very substantial piece of, of, the, of the value of that game. Now, uh, what, what we did in that example was not very costly, uh, as you can imagine. So we did it ourselves, and, and it, it took maybe one day to do that, okay? Um, for me, it was a, a showcase of if, if you keep it simple and you stick to um, a way to deliver the, the specific instruction that you want to give, those models were not actually accurate to the real world object. They were accurate to the functionality that we wanted to tell the user to do. Okay? So if we, if we think about what's the job to be done that we want to solve and we build models that are simplistic enough for them to immediately capture, okay, what I need to do is this, I need to decouple this thing, I need to screw, 
Um, we don't need to go very fine uh, detailed on those on those uh, objects, but I don't know the opinion of the other so panelists. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'll, the authoring platforms that I that I've looked at um, there's a difference between creating an asset that's the animation and animating an asset in the experience. So we should learn to make these distinctions in the way we explain what the platform offers or what your requirement was for your project. And so uh, most of the ones I've seen um, do allow, you have a stationary asset, it might look like a screwdriver in 3D, but within the AR authoring environment, you can tell it to spin, you can tell it to, because it's a, it's a 3D model. And or the, 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 um, the arrow moves, you know, in order to draw your attention to it. That's all done in the authoring environment. There was almost no, no pro, there was, it was a stationary dumb object when it started. Uh, well, that I think it speaks to the earlier questioner's point that uh, this is best in industrial or in enterprise environments best served back on the in the uh, the uh, model-based data development side. It, it's a natural outgrowth of of the processes that uh, they engage in of assembling and developing training materials, and I think we're going to see that down the line as far as quote animations go. Um, but for our com my company, we, we have a authoring uh, environment, and um, by the way, I'll, I'll be speaking about that at four o'clock in the dev track. Um, but you know, we um, we we feel that we have to make it as fast and easy as possible because it, you know, we all people are always asking us how long is this going to take us to create, and they might be looking at a proof of concept they paid us to to spend eight weeks working on, and we made it as great as possible. <laughs> and so it's sort of, sort of like, well, it won't look exactly like this, but, but here, let me show you, you know, here's something quick and dirty we can do. We can drop, we can drop some arrows on here, and we can have this out the door in, in 15 minutes. So it really depends on which, what your expectations are to some regards. I think the, one of the things I noticed in projects that I've seen and, and, and been involved in is, the use of animation, I agree, it can be excessive and inappropriate. There are some definitely places where, um, where it's not well used. But motion attracts our eye. I don't know exactly what the whole neuro deal is, but the human eye is trained to look for these, uh, especially things that are in your peripheral vision. I think that's sort of a meme that's going on now. Uh, so if you want to attract, uh, you want to bring attention, you make it move, and um, that bring, it's, it can even be small amounts of movement, very simple, but very valuable. Okay, uh, thanks for your comments. Uh, we are out of time. Um, I want to say thank you to our three speakers. If we could uh, join me in giving a round of applause.